Good morning. Welcome to Bethel Bible Fellowship. If you're visiting with us this morning, I want you to understand that we are working our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, we are currently in chapter 15. So if you want to turn there, we'll read our passage. Our passage will be 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 19. Now, there's only 16 chapters in 1 Corinthians, so it seems like we're almost done with the book, but um, we're actually going to be here until October in 1 Corinthians, so not moving too fast. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, Paul writing to the church at Corinth. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Father, as we approach your word, we ask you to use it in our hearts. We ask you to draw us to faith, to a deeper trust in you, and as Joel prayed, that you would change us thereby. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. So we saw last week that chapter 15 starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ, verses 1 through 11. And, as well, the eyewitness proof that Jesus Christ actually did physically rise from the dead. And the entire chapter is actually devoted to this topic. So here we have a letter addressed uh, to a struggling and divided church at Corinth, and the Holy Spirit directs Paul to write an entire chapter, a long chapter, on the resurrection. And I I think it raises the question, why? Why the topic of the resurrection here, in this place, in this letter? Now, we know that the central issue for every human being is the burning question, who is Jesus Christ? Everybody has to answer that question. And the historical fact of the empty tomb points to the historical fact of the resurrection, which confirms for every thinking person, I think, that Jesus is who he said he was. God in the flesh. And that's basically the gospel message, right? That because of mankind's sin and our total inability to save ourselves from the wrath of God, God, in his great mercy, left heaven. He stooped down. He came down to our level, becoming a man so that he could die on our behalf. He stooped down, condescended lowered himself. Think of it this way. Imagine you're up in the mountains, you're hiking, you're way back in the woods, and you're on a trail, and as you're walking along, you come around a corner, and there's a small child standing on the trail all by himself, lost, terrified, crying. What would you do? Now, I doubt if your first reaction would be to walk up to that child, tower over him, and start interrogating him about what happened and why he's alone in the woods. No, instead you'll probably crouch down, take a knee, speak softly, lower your voice, make eye contact, get on his level so that you can gently calm him down and draw him to yourself. Well, that's exactly what God did for us. In order to reach out and to save lost, frightened humanity, he stooped down. He lowered himself, and he became a man. And that was absolutely crucial to the justice of heaven, that he become a man, a real flesh and blood human being. Divine justice could not have been satisfied if Jesus didn't become a human. This is theologically crucial. See, man sinned. And so the justice of God demanded that man pay the price for that transgression. And so the Son of God lowered himself and he became a man so he could give his perfect 
life as a perfect sacrifice for us. He exchanged his righteousness for our guilt. Now, there's a danger here in that while we're looking at Jesus, God who stooped down to our level, we forget who he really is. So if you would, please turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Just because Jesus shrank himself down to get on our level so he could look us in the eye and draw us to himself does not mean that he stopped being God, ever. Not for even a second. So who is Jesus? Let's look at Colossians chapter 1 to see who Jesus of Nazareth really is. Colossians 1, beginning in verse 13. It says, He, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. That's Jesus. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Look at verse 16 again. For by him, by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Jesus is the almighty creator of everything. That's who Jesus is. Psalm 33, 6 says it this way. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. If you've ever watched any of Lou Giglio's videos, watch them again. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Think about that for a second. That is Jesus. That's the Jesus we're talking about. The heavens were made. He spoke them into existence. He breathed out the stars. How many stars are there? There's billions of galaxies filled with hundreds of billions of stars in a universe that's 92 billion light years across. How long is a light year? It's a measure of length. It's 5.88 trillion miles. How big is our, our universe? Take 92 billion light years and multiply it by 5.88 trillion miles. That's something, isn't it? Psalm 33, 6 says that Jesus spoke it into existence. He spoke out, breathed out the stars. Stars so big that they would dwarf our sun. Stars so big that they dwarf the diameter of our solar system. So when we see this carpenter from Galilee, Hanging on a Roman cross, we have to be so careful that we do not lose sight of the fact that he is the star breather. He is the star breathing God who chose to humble himself and to take the form of a servant so he could become obedient to death, even death on a cross, so that he could exchange his righteousness for our filthiness with the Father. He offered himself on our behalf to the Father so that justice, divine justice, eternal justice, could be accomplished. And so he died. So that he might crush the head of the serpent and break the chains of bondage and fear that held us captive. That's Jesus. So the star breather became the serpent slayer by dying and then death couldn't hold him. And the father raised him up to prove it. And to prove that the transaction of his exchange His righteousness for our filthiness had actually been accepted in the courts of heaven. See, there are many people today who are still willing to believe that Jesus was a good man, a wise teacher, and he went around doing a lot of good stuff. And they'll even call themselves Christians. But they've decided that they just cannot accept that Jesus rose from the grave. Not in a literal, physical sense. And really, what they're admitting is They can't see past the Jewish carpenter to see the star breather. Problem is, if you reject the resurrection, you reject the Savior. In other words, the resurrection is not just a side issue in biblical Christianity that you can take or leave. It is central to the gospel and it's central to our faith. Without the resurrection, Jesus would still be in the grave. 
and all of his teachings would prove false. Without the resurrection, there would be no church. The disciples would never have gone out in boldness and preached the gospel message and planted churches if they knew Jesus was not God, and they would have known that had he not risen from the grave. Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection. If you want to disprove Christianity, disprove the resurrection. It's that simple. Do that, and Christianity crumbles like a child's sandcastle on the beach under the waves of time. It can't stand. The only trouble is, after 2,000 years of trying to do that, no one's been able to do it. The historical fact remains, the tomb was empty. And the most reasonable explanation for the empty tomb is a physical resurrection of Christ. Now, there were some in Corinth who were willing to accept the resurrection of Christ, but denied the resurrection of the saints. Look at verse 12. It says, now if Christ, this is in 1 Corinthians 15, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? So apparently there were people in Corinth who were willing to accept the theoretical resurrection of Jesus from the dead, but rejected the fact that we will all also rise physically from the grave. I personally think it was because there was some pre-Gnostic thinking in Corinth, and they had decided, along with Plato and other ancients, that the spirit is good and the flesh is bad. And that in order to be super spiritual, which is a theme throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, you had to completely deny the flesh. Well, in denying the flesh, they also then had to deny a physical resurrection because that meant we would be in the flesh for all eternity, something that these folks apparently were not willing to accept. So Paul says to those in Corinth who were trying to deny the resurrection, all right, well, if that's your position, let's take a look at that more closely. I want you to take a look at the logical progression of that thought. If there is no resurrection, then there will be other ramifications. And that really is the rest of our passage. That's chapter 15, verses 12 through 19. There are seven consequences of this thought that there is no resurrection from the dead. So what we're going to do this morning is just go through those in order. First, verse 13. Paul says, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus is not alive. Quote, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Now, in Paul's day, just like today, there is this ongoing discussion about whether physical resurrection um, was true. Many denied physical resurrection. Gentiles and Jews as well. There was a whole sect of Judaism called the Sadducees who really believed that there is no resurrection from the dead, and they denied a lot of supernatural things. And many Gentiles denied that human bodies, once dead, could rise from the dead. And it seemed to be, apparently, a, a common idea in Corinth even in the church. Now, that idea is still popular today, right? It sounds very scientific. It really is quite scientific. According to human observation, do dead bodies come alive again? I'm asking. It's not rhetorical. We could do do an experiment. Go down to the morgue and take 1,000 dead bodies, 10,000 dead bodies. I guess you have to be in New York or someplace. Get 10,000 dead bodies, lay them all out, and watch them for a year. At the end of a year, how many of those 10,000 dead bodies will still be dead bodies? Of course, 10,000. Why? Because we know that dead people do not rise again physically from the dead, from, from the grave. That scientific proof is overwhelming. People do not rise from the dead physically. So the natural deduction, if that's the position you're going to hold, is that Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. And so the modern accusation that's made against you and against me, those of us who do believe in the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the saints, is that your religion and all of your theological thinking and even your hope in eternity is resting on something that has been proven scientifically to be categorically false. How foolish can you be? It's physically impossible for the dead to rise, and yet you're basing your eternal hope on that? You're foolish. Now, Paul simply wants the Corinthians to follow 
the flow of the argument that they've proposed. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ could not have risen. doesn't mean that Paul agrees with their thinking. He's just playing along with the flow of the argument. He's trying to point out to them that ideas do not exist in isolation. Ideas have consequences. So, folks, if you're going to deny the physical resurrection of the saints, then what else will follow logically from that deduction? Now, here Paul makes it very clear that the reality is that Jesus' resurrection is inextricably linked to our resurrection. Next week, we're going to see that Jesus is called the first fruits uh, of the resurrection. In other words, Jesus' resurrection sets the pattern for us. But we'll talk about that next week. So, first of all, first one, number one, Paul says if you're denying the resurrection of the saints, then you are also denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number two, verse 14, the second ramification of their thought. Paul says, quote, and if Christ has not been raised, then your preaching is in vain. If Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless. If you remove the resurrection from the gospel message, then you have no message. Jesus is still dead, and if Jesus is still dead, that makes him a liar because he said he was going to come back from the dead. And if he's a liar, then he's not our Savior. And our entire message and everything we have to say falls apart. Paul said all the way back in chapter 1, do you remember that? He said that the, the message of the cross is foolishness for people who think they've got the world all figured out. I mean, the, the idea, the very idea that your only hope in this world and for all eternity rests on the shoulders of a Jewish carpenter hanging on a cross over at the city dump is ludicrous. That's ridiculous. And Paul called it what it is. That's foolishness. The message of the cross is foolish. That is, if he never rose from the grave. Because if he did rise from the grave, then we do have a reason to hope in him because he is no longer dead, he is alive. Martin Luther once stated that to deny the resurrection is to deny that God is God. It's that simple. Third, if Christ has not been raised, according to verse 14, still in verse 14, then your faith is in vain. If Jesus did not rise from the grave, your faith is useless. Now, what was their faith in? What was the Corinthians' faith in? It was in the gospel. Look at verse 3 in chapter 15. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance that I, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. They believed that. That's what they were holding to. But if that last, last little bit, that third part, is not true, that he didn't rise on the third day, then our gospel is false and your faith is useless. See, if you're going to have biblical faith, then your faith has to be biblical. I know that sounds redundant, but it's true. I mean, how many people today are willing to say, oh, yeah, I, I have faith, I believe in God, but if you press them for details, they will never admit that they believe that they are sinners culpable before a holy and righteous God. A God who left his throne in heaven, took off his royal robe, set aside his scepter, and became a man so he could die in our place for our sins and rise again on the third day. Oh, they'll never admit that. No way, that's too narrow. Oh, no, 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 no. I have a much more inclusive faith than that, they'll tell you. A faith that encompasses a wide variety of beliefs. Well, that's all fine and good, but that's not biblical faith. Stop calling it that and stop quoting Bible verses if that's the category that you fall into. Biblical faith is based on the Bible, and the Bible is very clear. Jesus Christ rose from the dead on the third day. So, first, no resurrection. Jesus is still in the grave. Second, no resurrection. Our preaching is useless. Third, no resurrection. Your faith is futile. And number four, in verse 15, Without the resurrection, all the apostles are liars. Look what he says. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. In the book of Acts, this was the message of the apostles on the streets of Jerusalem with a very, very, very infant church. 
they went from being scared out of their minds, convinced that the Jews and the Romans were going to come and kill them the same way they killed Jesus. They went from that state of terror to a few weeks later, standing on the street corners of Jerusalem, in spite of the threats against their life, preaching a risen Jesus. Listen to what Peter says in Acts chapter 2. This is just a piece of his message. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus you delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, and you crucified and killed at the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses. Now you tell me, why would these guys go out and risk their necks to preach a message they knew was false? Think about it. If Jesus hadn't risen from the grave, these guys would have known it. Of all people, they would have known that he didn't do that. Now, the popular argument to that is they just stole the body from the tomb to make it look like Jesus had risen from the dead. And then they went out and they started spreading the message of his resurrection, spreading this false narrative that Jesus was alive. Now, I can see, you know, going out, people going out and spreading a false message if it's going to get them fame or fortune or something, if they're going to get somewhere by it. But what did these guys get out of it? They got arrested. They got thrown in prison and eventually executed. They were hung. They were crucified. They were beheaded. They were drawn and quartered, stoned, boiled, burned, and fed to the wild beasts. And yet every single one of them in their last breath, was still testifying to the truth of an empty tomb and a risen Savior. Why would they do that if they knew it was a lie? Because if they had stolen the body and hidden in a shallow grave out in the desert, they would have known. Someone once said, people will die for a conviction, but they won't die for a concoction. They died by the hundreds after testifying to have seen him risen from the dead. Now, the implication of the Corinthians' statement is clear, as Paul points out in verse 15. If Jesus has not been raised, then the apostles are, are all a bunch of liars. Liars of the worst order because they're leading people astray into an error, not just for this life, but for all eternity. They're playing with the eternal souls of people with this lie, and they knew it was wrong. Number five, verse 16, if there is no resurrection you are still in your sins. He says, for if the dead are not raised, even Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. In other words, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then you are not a new person. And your life has not been radically changed. It's all just wishful thinking. All the habits that you think you've broken because of the power of God and your changed attitudes, that's not because of the power of God. It's just a placebo, wishful thinking. And not only that, not only are you still living in your sin and sin in you, but you're still guilty of your sin. You're, you still stand condemned before a holy and righteous God. And I love what Paul does here. This is a hard message, but look at the gentleness with which he delivers it. He says, when the Corinthians say they doubt the resurrection of the, of the dead, does Paul come out and just blast them and say, you're wrong? Don't you folks ever read your Bible? Get a clue. No, he doesn't do that. He says, okay, okay. If you say there is no resurrection of the dead, well, let's just see the progression of that. You said there's no resurrection. If that's true, then Jesus has not been raised. If Jesus hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain, and you're still in your sins. And not only that, we're all liars. And we're all still lost and headed for hell. But Paul says to him, we know that's not true. If you go back up to verse 1, look at verse 1, chapter 15. Paul agrees that they have received the gospel message. And in verse 2, he agrees that they are now saved. See, these folks wanted to believe that the gospel was theoretically true, that the, that the, 
the resurrection of Jesus, the physical resurrection of Jesus, well, maybe. But they were more on this. It was probably a spiritual, theoretical resurrection. But they were confused about what was going to happen to them when they passed from this life into the next life. And again, this kind of thinking is not that uncommon today among Christians. You know, this idea that, that we don't really know what it's going to be like when we die. You know, when we die, we're probably just going to be spirits, disembodied spirits, that if you could really see the spirits, they would be like chubby little babies with wings buzzing around, right? And there's still, there are a lot of Christians who actually believe this kind of stuff. To which Paul says in verse 18, no. And this is the sixth consequence if you're writing down the list. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, if there is no resurrection, those who have died believing in Jesus are lost in hell. There's no hope. If Jesus has not been raised, then the gospel is false. And if the gospel is false, then when you die, you're going to be lost forever. And finally, the seventh hypothetical consequence of denying the resurrection is in verse 19. If in Christ we have hoped in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Why would Paul say we are of all people most to be pitied? Well, if it's only for this life that we've hoped in Christ and there's nothing afterwards and there is no eternal hope of eternal life, then we've wasted our life here preaching an empty message, a message that's nonsense, a message that only leads to death and to loss. And the apostles and Jesus were constantly challenging Christians to lay down their own lives and to live for him, to spread the word, which Paul did. Look over at verse 30. Paul says, we are in danger every hour. Paul was preaching a dangerous message. It put him in danger to preach this message. Look at verse 32. He says, what do I gain? If humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Paul had given up everything for the sake of the gospel and the, for the sake of the Christ that he loved so dearly. And Paul wanted to be a witness for Christ. But it cost him. If you go back to chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, God has put us on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe. We are fools for Christ. We are weak. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. Why is all this true about Paul? Because he loved Jesus and he loved the gospel message so much that he put himself at risk. He says, we always carry in our body. Oh, excuse me, I skipped. When we curse, are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. The gospel cost Paul dearly. If you skip forward to ch uh, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, he says this about his ministry, his wonderful life in Christ. We are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may, re may be revealed in our body. We are always being given over to death for his sake. Chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, he goes on. He says, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in dishonor, bad report, regarded as imposters, unknown, dying, sorrowful, poor. Chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, he goes on. He says, I've been in prison, frequently flogged, severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles. This is a dangerous message. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. That was God's wonderful plan for Paul's life. 
in the preaching of the gospel. So Paul says, if we have let go of our families and our careers and our comfort and our safety and the gospel is not true, then we are of all people most to be pitied. Now, it's not hard to see why Paul said he should be pitied if all of that was for nothing. But it makes me want to ask about us. Do you think most North American Christians today that their lives would be radically changed if they woke up tomorrow and found out that the resurrection was false? What about you? How would the realization that the resurrection is false change your life, 21st century Christian? Paul assumes that having trusted Christ and decided to follow him, our lives would be so radically dif different that if we found out it wasn't true, it would be pitiable. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to all suffer the same way Paul did. We don't live under Nero's rule, and we're not in danger of persecution from the Jews or from the Romans. Paul's point here simply is this, that those who belong to Christ are supposed to take up their own crosses and deny themselves. They're supposed to be pouring themselves out for the gospel. And if pouring themselves out for the gospel, if that gospel is an empty message, then truly it is pitiable. Now, that's where our passage this morning ends. Verse 19. We don't get to study verse 20. That's next week. But we got to read it. So let's read verse 20. Paul says, although that's true, if, if your logical, logical progression from 12 through 19 is true, it's a hopeless, pitiable situation. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Praise God. Can I get an amen? I heard an amen. Thank you. And really, that should be the end of our message. But I got a lot of time left, and we don't have Sunday school, and I think Dwight needs some more time cooking. Why are you guys in here? <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah if, if you're making plans on leaving here as soon as the service is over, please don't. There's some really good Filipino food out there, and uh, I think I've tasted every dish at a potluck or one potluck or another at MVCS, so please stay. Instead of ending the message here, what I would like to do is to flip the script. Paul began this paragraph in verse 12 by noting that some of the believers in Corinth denied the resurrection of the dead. And if the dead are not raised, then Jesus is still dead. And if Jesus is still dead, then there's this series of seven dire consequences to that line of thinking. So let's flip that and see what we would say if Jesus had been raised. Let's take verse 20 and slip it up in, in front of verse 12. So instead of saying, if there is no resurrection then, which we just did, let's now read it in line with the truth. Since there is a resurrection, then what? So the first one in verse 13. Paul said, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So what's the flip side? Oh, yeah, since there is a resurrection, then Jesus is alive. And not only is Jesus alive, he is our life. He is the very reason that you were able to be born again and actually changed from the inside out, given a new heart and a new mind and a spirit that's alive, given the life of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus is alive. In fact, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you're a believer in Jesus, he is like oxygen for your soul. We need Jesus like we need water. Christianity is not just about agreeing with a bunch of religious concepts. It's about having an intimate, personal relationship with a person, with the very person who spoke you into existence, with the person who spoke the universe into existence. That's Christianity. And I know the argument that some people like to use. Well, since science disproves the resurrection, we all know dead bodies do not come back to life. And so your faith is stupid. It's ridiculous. Now, if you're in that conversation with that person, you could simply say, well, I believe in God and God's able to work miracles. 
But a scientifically minded person is not gonna accept that. So why not address it in a more scientific way? Why not tell this person, remind them of all the things that science has proved that were once laughable. You know, like the idea that of all the scientists who laughed at the thought of nuclear energy. Psh, atoms can't be split. We've proven it. We've never split an atom. That's proof that atoms can't be split. Okay. Or, you know, the, the idea that, that scientists proved that the universe had no beginning until Hubble and Einstein came along. Or this idea that spontaneous generation is true. Science proved that. For centuries, for millennia, scientists believed that life could just spring out of non-living things. Remember when science proved that heart transplants were a fantasy? And that men couldn't fly and that metal ships couldn't float? Yeah. And now they think that they've proved that God can't raise the dead. But they're still stuck with, what do you do with the empty tomb 2,000 years ago? All serious historians agree on the same fact. The tomb was empty. And hundreds of people claim to have seen a risen Savior. And those people, at the risk of their own lives, started what we now know as the Christian church that has stood the test of 2,000 years. All right, second. Verse 14 says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. But since Christ has been raised, our preaching is not in vain. What a powerful truth that is. The truth is that the message that we have is an eternal message. It's a life-giving message. We've been commissioned by God himself to take this message to the world. And since he left heaven and came here, he said, I will never leave you alone in that endeavor. Go out and spread the message. It's not in vain. It's spirit power, powered. It's God ordained and it's life giving. It's sharp and penetrating. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Our preaching is not in vain. Praise God. Your message that you share with your family and your friends and your co workers is not in vain. God's word does not return to him empty, but it always accomplishes what he purposes it for. Third, still in verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain. Ah, but Christ has been raised, and so your faith is not in vain. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith, that trust in God, that trust that you can actually receive the gift, the free gift of salvation from him, purchased by Jesus on the cross, that trust is well-founded. See, your trust is only as good as the person you place it in, right? And we've all trusted people who've let us down, I'm sure. You'll never have that problem with Jesus. Because your trust is not in a Jewish carpenter who got himself crucified by the Romans. No, your trust is in the star breather. Your trust is in the one who created everything and then came here and died for you and then rose from the grave. And that resurrection proves that your faith is not vain. Four, verse 15. If Christ has not been raised, then we are found to be misrepresenting God. Literally, Paul says, we are false witnesses. All of us apostles who are going around preaching this message are a bunch of liars. We know better. Because we testified that God raised Jesus from the dead, but we know better than that. Huh. But... Since Jesus has been raised, the apostles are not false witnesses. And everything they taught and the things that they wrote are true. Truth. What a, what a novel idea in a day and age where so many people are convinced there's no such thing as absolute truth. I find great confidence and comfort in being able to open up my Bible and know that I'm not reading the words of men but rather the word of God. Five, in verse 17, it says, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. <laughs> yes, but Christ has been raised. So you are not in your sins if you're trusting him. What a truth. And there's two ramifications to that. There's two ways to take that. We are not still in our sins in the sense that we are not still in the guilt of our sins. No, our, our sins have been washed. We've been forgiven. 
Jesus took the debt that was against us and he canceled it by nailing it to the cross. It was paid in full so that Jesus, hanging on the cross, said, to Telestai, done, finished, once for all. Your sins are washed clean by the perfect blood of the Lamb of God. Now, the other way to take that, we are no longer in our sins, is that we are no longer under the power of sin. We are no longer walking in our sins. Not only did you get washed of your sin and forgiven when you came to Christ, but you were also raised with him in some spiritual, mystical way so that the power of the resurrection is now at work in you. Peter says that we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You've been born again to a living hope, not just through the death of Jesus, but through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus is linked to our rebirth, and it's all throughout the New Testament if you care to study it. Paul says in both Ephesians and Colossians that God made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him. 2,000 years later, somehow. Do you remember Paul's prayer for the Ephesians in chapter 1? Don't turn there, but you know, jot it down, look it up later. There, Paul connects the power of the resurrection with the spiritual power that is at work within us. And he tells the Ephesians that he's praying that they would know Quote, what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power in us who believe according to the working of his great might which he accomplished in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead and made him sit at the right hand in the heavenly places. The power, that great power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that is at work in you, child of God. Paul said that his goal in life in Philippians chapter 3, do you remember what his goal in life was he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Resurrection power living in you. That's something. Now this is very important to the Corinthian situation because the Corinthians were all about spiritual power. Every situation, every problem that we've read about in the book of 1 Corinthians is somehow linked to their thirst to have spiritual power, to be spiritual. Well, Paul basically says, Corinthians, you want spiritual power? Well, that's only supplied to us through the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. And since Jesus did rise from the grave, you are no longer in the grip of sin. And you don't have to walk in it any longer. 6, verse 18. It says, if Christ has not been raised, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. But since Christ has been raised, those people haven't perished. When they left here, they went to be with God in Christ forever. What an amazing thought. One day we're going to get to go see them again. And we're going to get to renew those relationships and those friendships. What a reunion that will be. And finally, number 7, verse 19 says, If Christ has not been raised, then we are of all people most to be pitied. But the fact is, Christ has been raised. And so we, we are not to be pitied. We are not to pity ourselves. There's no need to pity each other. And we certainly shouldn't be looking to the world to pity us for the fact that we have trusted in Christ. See, whether your head is on a chopping block, literally, or you're living in poverty as a missionary in some jungle somewhere, or you're risking your job by sharing the gospel with the people you work with, there's no place for pity. In fact, of all people, we are most to be envied. Folks, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you literally have won the lottery. And I don't mean a lottery where you win a few million measly dollars that you can spend in a couple of years and then be left with nothing except a bunch of broken trinkets and toys and relationships. No, I'm talking about winning the lottery where Jesus died on your behalf and offered you the free gift of salvation so that you get eternity in paradise eternity in paradise with the one that your soul loves. No, in fact, of all people, we are most to be envied. The Corinthian believers wanted spiritual power. That really is the theme throughout the book. And every problem that Paul has addressed points to that. They wanted to be spiritual. But Paul says, you're not going to get your spiritual power, folks, 
through your rhetoric or your wisdom or through sex or through food or through your teachers or through pleasure or through your position or through the exercise of your gifts. Those are all themes that we've addressed. No, your spiritual power is to be found solely in Jesus Christ who gave himself for us and was raised to life. The one who came to annul the curse in every aspect, even this aspect of physical death. He annulled it so that we will live for all eternity in resurrected bodies. Praise God that we do serve a risen Savior. Let's pray. Father, we realize that our lives are in your hands, that we take every breath simply because you allow it and will it. And we praise you for that, that you are the Almighty. And I pray that as we, we think of your raising Jesus from the grave in that act of defiance against the last enemy, that you also use that power in our lives to change us, to be the people you want us to be. And so we ask you that as we continue in worship and lift up our voices, that you would allow that to be the case. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us.